Hi there, my name is Gordon Dreger, and thank you for joining today's video blog. Our topic is seven considerations for those planning to go on a European river cruise. I'm the founder of Wheel and & Anchor and author of a book, Heart of Hospitality, which talks about um, hospitality in the tourism industry. Uh, and I've been in travel. I've, I've planned, coordinated and hosted trips for Canadians for almost 30 years. Uh, and I have watched the evolution of the river cruise business in Europe uh, ever since it was uh, a novelty that relatively few people are aware of to today where it is very mainstream. So in today's video, I'd like to discuss these seven things that uh, that you ought to consider if you're planning on a, river, a European river cruise. And please note that this video is not about the river cruise companies and the ships themselves. So I think there is a lot of information available on the internet that talks about the various amenities comparing uh, one cruise company to the other and the cabins and the food and all of the onboard experience. That's all fine. I think you'll find lots of information about that. This video is about seven considerations that um, you might not ha have otherwise given thought to, um, but would be very important in deciding what is the right river cruise for you. So the first consideration I'd like you to think about uh, in planning for a European river cruise uh, is the number of countries that you travel through. Now, if you are an avid traveler uh, and you've been to Europe a number of times before, if you've already cruised on some of the rivers of Europe, this may not be a factor, but I'm talking to you if you're someone who perhaps hasn't had as much uh, experience traveling around Europe uh, and you're, you're really trying to cover as much ground as you can on one trip. And so some of the longer rivers in Europe, most notably like the Danube and the Rhine, specifically the Danube, you can cover a lot of rivers. In fact, if you combine the Danube and the Rhine, um, you can begin all the way up in the North Sea and sail all the way down through uh, the Benelux countries into Germany, uh, Austria, onto Hungary, and all the way out to the Black Sea. So you can actually cover a large number of countries all in one trip. Uh, the, uh, the Rhine River, for example, as well, um, which begins in Switzerland, uh, you also travel through a number of countries, uh, and so you can really cover a lot of ground if uh, if it's an important factor for you to, to, to sort of cover a lot of, of countries on one trip. So for many of you, this may not be an important consideration, um, but certainly uh, a lot of the river cruises uh, in France, for example, the Seine, uh, the Dordogne, the Rhone, uh, are all pretty much inside one country. Not that that's a bad thing, but if an objective is uh, to to cover a number of countries on one trip, then then you know those would be less ideal for you. So um, that's factor number one. The second consideration, um, which is much more important, is choosing between a popular or a less popular river. So let me give you a couple different examples. If you have cruised on rivers in Europe before, you're likely to have cruised on, for example, the Danube or the Rhine. And those two are undoubtedly the most popular river cruises in Europe. And why is this important? Well, they're popular for very good reasons. Um, they're popular because there's a sort of an optimal distance between stops along the way. Um, and you have some beautiful scenery, particularly. Uh, and I'll talk more about scenery uh, in one of the other considerations in scenery and landscapes. Um, but there clearly is some beautiful scenery, castles, these shore excursions are great. Overall, you get a lot of value in the one week, uh, for example, that you would spend uh, aboard ship. So Danube and Rhine, very popular. Um, but conversely, uh, and you know, keep in mind that there are around 400 river cruise ships sailing on the waters in Europe right now. So uh, for a relatively limited amount of actual water river surface area, that's a lot of ships. Um, and the number has grown uh, by sort of five to 10% every year for at least the last 10 years. So it does mean that you'll find on the more popular rivers more congestion. It means wherever you're moored, you may be racked up with other vessels. So you may have to cross one, two, or even three um, boats to get off your, uh, off your ship onto shore. Um, it means that the ports themselves, um, some of these quaint little towns um, may be busier because you'll have more than one ship in at the same time. Um, you're just, there's a lot more activity going on. Um, but as I say, for good reason, you get a lot of value on those cruises in terms of what you see. Um, conversely, the less popular rivers, um, and when I say less popular, you know, there's various gradients of that because 
you know, uh, for example, uh, the Duro is less popular than the, the Danube or the Rhine, but it has become increasingly, increasingly popular um, in recent years. And similarly, the Rhone River, um, which flows uh, on the east side of France from, uh, from Lyon all the way down to the Mediterranean, um, less popular perhaps than the Rhine and the Danube, just judging by the number of ships that are there, um, but still uh, there are a number of comp companies offering cru uh, cruises on these rivers for very good reason. Um, and you could go even beyond that, and there are rivers like, for example, the Guadalquivir, which you may not have even heard of. I hadn't heard of it until a number of years ago. This is in southern Spain, it flows out of the um, Sierra mountain range in southern Spain, down through Seville and out to the Mediterranean. Um, so there's a river where there are really only a small handful of ships that are sailing. And so if you're looking for a river cruise experience, but don't necessarily want um, the, the super popular ones, or if you've already been and you love it and you're looking for a different place to go, then you might want to consider one of the less popular rivers in Europe. The third consideration I'd like to talk to you about in regards to cruising on European rivers is the scenery and the landscape. Now, it's important to point out here that this is really where there's a big difference between um, ocean cruising, like coastal voyages, uh, to river cruises, because on a river cruise, of course, there's no such thing as a sea day. So you're not just sailing along um, with, with, with nothing to do or no place to stop. That doesn't happen on, uh, on any European river cruises, where obviously you do have that on ocean cruises. Um, and so there is undoubtedly rivers that are more scenic, where you could literally spend almost the whole time on board ship um, seeing what there is to see along the way. But let's remember that the, the main point about river cruises is, is really it's more about the destinations than the scenery. But that being said, who doesn't like uh, you know a scenic cruise through wonderful landscapes? So if I talk about my previous point about the most popular cruises, part of the reason they're popular is because they do have wonderful scenery along the way. Um, if you look at the Danube, for example, the central Danube uh, in Austria has the Wachau Valley, which has got monasteries and castles and terraced vineyards, really uh, quite picturesque countryside. Uh, similarly, on the Rhine River, uh, the Rhine uh, south of Frankfurt um, is known as sort of Castle Alley. So you have one castle after another perched up on a hilltop, again, terraced vineyards, um, simply some of the most picturesque countryside. But not all rivers are like that. Some of the rivers um, actually don't really have as much to see outside the river. So if you talk about, uh, for example, cruising through um, uh, the, the, the so-called tulip cruises that they have, uh, in Holland and, and Belgium. Um, here, for the most part, the countryside is, is a little bit more bland and primarily the things that there are to see are available off ship. And I think that's an important point when you're considering scenery and landscapes is that some of the sites that are described in the brochure can't actually be seen from a board ship. It's part of the shore excursion. You have to get on a coach and uh, a drive for a little bit to get to the actual um, scenic part. Uh, and so uh, when, you, when you're choosing a river cruise, uh, if, if beautiful scenery and landscapes is important to you, um, probably best to stick to the ones um, that are more well known uh, because they do have uh, the better scenery. Um, but that being said, there are less popular rivers, like take the Loire, for example, uh, that goes through the central part of France. Um, the Loire Valley, full of some of the most beautiful chateaus um, that you'll find in all of France, and of course, um, wonderful wine region. Uh, but there aren't a lot of river cruise company uh, companies offering cruises there. Um, if you look, for example, in the southern part of France, um, in the Bordeaux region, the Dordogne and the Garonne rivers, um, here uh, I would describe the landscape is frankly very boring. It's, uh, it's, it's flat, um, there's very little to see, uh, and so you're not gonna join a river cruise like that expecting uh, great, um, great landscapes. If you look at the Douro River in Portugal again, um, actually the main reason that people do go on it uh, is because of, uh, of all the wonderful pictures that they show again of these um, steep terraced banks uh, of the Douro River that you, that you pass through that are one of the prime features for, in terms of um, scenery and landscapes on, uh, on European river cruises. So let's talk about the fourth consideration in selecting a European river cruise. Um, and this is the mooring locations where your ship will actually stop at the various uh, towns and cities along the way. This is a very important point, actually. And what you'll find is, is that 
Um, often that information is, um, it's certainly available from the river cruise company, but you sometimes have to dig a little bit deeper. And it's important um, that you, you do that research and you familiarize yourself um, with where your ship is actually going to be docked um, in the very, at the various ports along the way. Um, because one of the virtues that is extolled by, by river cruise lines and um, certainly is, is a big selling point is the fact that you can um, walk on and off the ship and, and do your own thing. You don't necessarily have to participate in the shore excursions. And I'll talk about shore excursions in just a moment. Um, but that isn't always the case, the ability to just walk on and off the ship, because sometimes uh, for, for logistical and other reasons, the ship has to be parked, uh, has to be moored further away from town, such that you would need some kind of transportation to be able to, to get to the destination. If you take, for example, again, talking about the popular rivers like the Danube, um, in Vienna, the Danube passes um, outside uh, the downtown part of Vienna by a couple of kilometers. So um, while there are taxis readily available, um, you, you, you have that extra amount of sort of planning and time um, to get from the mooring spot um, into town. Uh, you can, in, in the case of Vienna, you can also take a public transit, but involves a bit of a walk to the subway station um, and then several stops to, to get into the, into the center of town. Um, on the other hand, if you look at Lyon uh, in France on the Rhone River or where the Rhone and the Seine Rivers uh, converge, um, the ships there are very much within walking distance of uh, of the uh, of the old town of the central central part of of Lyon, um, similarly Budapest on the Danube, uh, the ships are generally parked right uh, across from the Parliament buildings, close to the Chain Bridge, within walking distance of uh, many of the things that you'd want to see. Um, on the other hand, in Moscow, for example, if you're on the Volga River, uh, it's 45 minutes to get to um, uh, to to the central Red Square and the central parts. Uh, of Moscow from your river cruise ship. So you really do um, need to, to plan your day. You can't just conveniently walk um, on and off the ship. Uh, and talking about the tulip cruises that uh, be often begin and end in Amsterdam, um, sometimes you'll get lucky uh, and some of the river cruise ships are actually parked quite close to um, Central Station, uh, the main railway station and the center of town in Amsterdam. Often they are uh, quite a bit further away, again, owing to the number of vessels. So it's important that you um, look into that, know, ask the question, where is it my ship is gonna be parked? and also relative to the excursions and the activities that you want to do. If you're somebody that likes to do things on your own, um, it's gonna be important to choose a river cruise, um, uh, either the itinerary and the cruise line that have you um, have mooring locations that you can, um, you can readily go to the places that you wanna go uh, on your own steam. The next point I'd like to discuss is about the starting and ending point of your cruise. Now, most travelers heading off to Europe to go on a river cruise are typically going to stay longer than the one or two weeks that the cruise itself is actually going to take. They're more likely to uh, go a little bit in advance or stay on a few days or even a few weeks um, afterwards. And so it's it, then important to take into consideration where you're gonna start and where you're gonna end your cruise. And with a vast number of cruises that are available, there's actually a lot of options. And once again, of course, as you can imagine, the popular um, the popular rivers are going to have um, varying itineraries where you can embark or disembark the ship, whereas the less popular uh, rivers, the less frequented rivers are, are going to have fewer options. So again, just to give you a couple of examples, the Douro River in Portugal, um, most people are going to embark uh, in the city of Porto, um, which is at the mouth of the Douro River as it exits into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, and then cruise uh, both up the river and then back downstream and disembark in Porto. Um, Handy Porto is a lovely town, for example, um, so it makes a lot of sense to do that as a round-trip cruise, but there are one-way cruise options. And personally, in most cases, I tend to prefer a one-way cruise because you don't pass the same scenery twice. Um, and, and given that, you know, the actual scenic parts of most rivers can be somewhat limited, um, there's not sort of a lot of reason to backtrack um, unless it, it's more convenient for you to fly in and out of the same destination, uh, the same gateway, that is. So 
Um, on the Douro River, again, as an example, there are some cruise itineraries where you can embark in Porto and then get off um, on the Spanish-Portuguese border. Um, however, it's about a four-hour journey from there to any larger city like Madrid, for example. Now, again, the river cruise lines will probably include that as a post-trip package, but if you wanted to do cruise only, and again, I'm going to talk a little bit about the inclusions in a moment, um, then you, your options for onward travel may be a little bit limited. Um, on the Danube, for example, the classic Danube trip uh, that is perhaps one of the most popular itineraries. It goes from Prague to Budapest, um, a, again, a one-way journey. But here's an important point about the starting point, and it's interesting, you'd be surprised the number of times I get this comment, is, is that the river cruise doesn't actually begin in Prague because the Danube River doesn't flow anywhere through Prague. Um, so the Prague to Budapest river cruise um, is a land tour in Prague for two or three days, um, and then you travel by coach about three or four hours depending on the embarkation point, and that will usually be either Nuremberg, uh, Regensburg, or Passau. So important to keep that in mind because, for example, if you are planning to book the uh, Prague to Budapest as a cruise only, keep in mind that you have to have the land component uh, to get between Prague and the embarkation point, or if you're doing it in reverse, uh, between the disembarkation point and Prague. So again, an important point to know, but you can also cruise the Danube on a round trip basis. There are cruise companies that will offer, for example, from Passau, and they'll go down the river as far as Vienna or Budapest, and then back upstream to get back to Passau. So you can do that as a um, a, a round trip voyage as well. And then just to give you one more example, um, the Seine River uh, is typically you embark on the Seine in Paris, um, head out to the Normandy coast, and then return to Paris. So most of the cruises you'll find are round trip. But if you look hard, you can find cruises that end start in Paris and end in Honfleur, uh, which is uh, again uh, where the Seine exits uh, into the uh, into the the um, English Channel. And so uh, if you are, for example, planning to go on that cruise because you've read all about um, visiting the World War II landing sites, the beaches of Normandy and so on, um, that's fine, but you won't have a lot of time on the cruise. There's a lot of ground to cover in one day. So you'd be better off finding that one-way cruise uh, and then ending your trip, for example, in, um, in Enfleur. So very important to keep in mind the starting and ending points of your trip. So the sixth thing I'd like you to consider when you're planning your European river cruise is when to go. Now, of course, everybody would like to go when the weather is perfect, when it's 22 or 3 degrees and the sun is shining and it's dry every day. Um, that's obviously the on, on everybody's wish list. Um, the reality in Europe is that, you know, their sailing season is, is longer because spring in Europe comes earlier and fall typically comes later than what we're accustomed to in Canada. So that's generally good news. Now, most people look to book in the months of May and June and September and early October. So that's the peak season for river cruising in Europe. And as a result, the prices are the highest, the ships are at their busiest, um, and generally speaking, um, it's those, that's kind of the busiest time to travel in most places in Europe. So it comes with um, the, the, um, the you know, increased numbers of people. Now, July and August, summertime, you would, a lot of people think that July and August is uh, sort of the peak season to travel, and it's certainly a good time to go to Europe. But remember that Europe, particularly in recent years, has been come, become quite hot in the summer season, particularly Southern Europe, particularly if you're considering uh, the Rhone River or the Guadalquivir or the Bordeaux region, the Dardogne or the Garonne rivers. Um, and so I would probably sway away from that if you're somebody who's not a fan of a lot of heat because it can easily get into that to the high 30s and 40s at that time of the year. Um, on the other side of the coin, uh, if you travel uh, early in the season, so a lot of river cruise companies are starting as early as late March and April, um, or if you go late into the latter part of October, November, and even December, um, the prices can be half or even less 
what they are in peak season. So it's worthwhile to consider that. Um, November at home can be a lousy time of the year uh, to, to, to be at home. A lot of people like to travel in November. And while you're certainly not gonna get 22 degrees in all likelihood, uh, certainly in Central Europe, um, it is, it's possible that you'll have decent enough weather that you'll have a good time and you'll save a lot of money in the process. Another important thing about choosing the time of the year is water levels. And of course with climate change, this has become a more and more important factor. So in the springtime, if they've had a, a season, a winter with a lot of snow or a lot of rain, the water levels can get quite high. And some rivers like the Danube, for example, have certain bridges where the river cruise boats cannot pass underneath if water levels are too high. Now that has been less of a problem in recent years, as opposed to the opposite problem, which is water levels being too low. And that happens in August, in September. And so that time of the year, you really want to be mindful that some rivers um, can run so dry to the point that the ships can no, can no longer navigate and you'd have to do part of the itinerary by coach, which is not a lot of fun. Of course, you know, there's nothing we can do about mother nature, but I know for example, that one river cruise line who were sailing between Prague and Berlin have now actually suspended that itinerary because consistently the river has been too low for a good three or four weeks a year and they haven't been able to run the itinerary. So water levels, um, definitely an important factor to consider in choosing the time of year. Um, and one other point I want to make is the Christmas markets. And if you haven't been to a Christmas market in Europe, you kind of owe it to yourself. They're a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of tradition and authenticity um, and often the music that's played and the food and drink and the crafts that are on offer uh, are all very uh, traditional, homemade. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful experience. And Christmas markets cruises um, are all also because they happen obviously from the end of November until uh, beginning middle of December, um, it's the off season. And so pricing can be very, very good. So that's a, a little tip for those of you that might not have otherwise considered to go at that time of the year. I can recommend the Christmas market cruises. And so the last point I'd like to discuss with you about uh, choosing your European river cruise are um, what's included. And when I talk about what's included, I'm specifically talking about um, the shore excursions. Uh, I think it's important also to look about, look at carefully at the inclusions on board the ship, uh, you know, whether or not, for example, beverages are included with meals or all day long or not at all. Um, those are important factors as well. But let's focus for a minute on uh, the excursions. And I think one key point here is, is that, uh, again, as I discussed before, a differentiator between ocean cruises, big ship cruises, and river cruises is, is that you're not generally going for the onboard experience. It's all, it's here with river cruise, it's all about the destination. You look, the ships are small, they don't have a lot of amenities on board. Um, and so that being said, um, I don't want to, for a moment, a, um, uh, uh, alienate those people who may be going for uh, just to stay on board the river cruise ship. And in that particular case, I would say, you know, choose a ship where, choose a cruise where um, none of the excursions are included, um, where the ship does have, you know, nicer, more comfortable onboard amenities, and where you have great scenery, something to see along the way. And I think that there are definitely cruises that would, that would, that would fit the bill. But let's assume for a moment that you are going because of the destinations along the way. So then it's very important to think about um, what's included on your cruise, because again, there's a lot of differences between the cruise lines. You can have everything from an all-inclusive cruise where all of your shore excursions are part of the uh, tour price, or you can have one where none of them are part of the tour price, or you can have something in between where there's different packages offering different kind of cruises. And so the, uh, for me, apart from the price, now keep in mind that the, uh, the shore excursions can make up anywhere up to around 25% of the or overall cost of the cruise. So if you're comparing cruise A to cruise B to C, make sure that you understand what in shore excursions are included because, you know, there may be, you know, $1,000 uh, price difference, but if one has all the excursions included and the other one doesn't, well, that would, you know, may make up a, a, a fair amount of that difference. So, so important to give that adequate consideration, but beyond just the cost aspect of it, um, I, I, for, for, for people who are avid travelers, I think you want to ask yourself, do you really want to go on all the excursions? And so, you know, for me, I can, I've traveled through pretty much all of the cities where river cruises stop throughout Europe. 
and and I envision for myself, you know, those hordes of of those of tour groups, uh, you know, walking behind forty people behind the person with the sign, and you've got one uh, one company after the other, um, and it's kind of the experience that uh, a lot of our travelers, um, you know, tend to want to avoid, um, and so uh, I, I think that. Again, the benefit about river cruises is that in many places you can go off and do do your own thing, and so you really want to decide: Do I want to participate in all the excursions, or some of the excursions, or maybe none of the excursions? And you know, in that particular case, what my suggestion is is that for the popular routes, and again, I've talked about this a couple of times for rivers like the Danube and the Rhine um, and the Douro. Um, you, you, there are a lot of options when you arrive in these various ports. So I would be inclined to say, oh, maybe I'm not going to take the included excursions. Maybe I'm going to do my own thing. Um, and even if um, the, the, the destination that you're visiting from the river is a little bit further away, often you can find companies who will provide like private tours or even just a local guide, or you can just go out and walk around on your own and, and avoid sort of the, uh, you know, the congestion that comes with all of these included um, uh, shore excursions. On the other hand, for the rivers that are less popular, and again, here I'm thinking about uh, rivers like, uh, you know, the Guadalquivir or uh, or even the Seine or the Dordogne, um, there's a lot less ships on the river and hence uh, probably a lot less opportunities to make arrangements yourself, then I'd be maybe a little bit more inclined to stick with the ship's shore excursions um, uh, because you may not have a lot of options. Um, so that's some of the things to think about as uh, as it relates to the inclusions. Um, and it's something that's worth spending some time to figure out um, what makes the most sense for you. Okay, so just a quick recap. The seven things that I suggest you consider in selecting a European river cruise are, first of all, the number of countries that your cruise is going to go through, um, whether or not the river uh, in question is a popular or a less popular one, um, the scenery and the landscape uh, along the way. Um, then I talked a little bit about the mooring location where the ship is actually going to stop at the various ports, um, the starting and ending point of the cruise, uh, and then I talked about um, the time of the year to go and um, the inclusion, specifically the shore excursions that are included. And so all of this assumes that you've already made up your mind to go on a river cruise, that it is the right kind of holiday for you. Um, and I think it is for a lot of people, particularly for first time travelers to Europe. It is really a great way to see a lot uh, in, a, in a high quality uh, environment where you know everything is gonna just go very, very well. Um, but I wouldn't be giving you the benefit of all of my knowledge and advice on the matter if I didn't say um, as to whether or not some people, particularly those who are more avid travelers, might consider alternate um, uh, alternate ways to, to visit Europe. And I know that um, at Wheel and Anchor, we've been developing some programs um, that are meant to give a little bit more of an in-depth glance at some of these places. And uh, one of the biggest complaints that our members has made, uh, our members have um, made about uh, trips that they've been on, not, not with us, but um, with other companies, is that they tend to be quite hectic. You know, you go from place to place, each day is in a new place and you're on the clock because the ship it arrives at one time and you um, and you leave four or five, six hours later. So you're always in a bit of a rush and there's not a lot of free time. Um, and so for, for those that are, you know, very active and keen to see all they can in a short period of time, again, it's perfect. But we find a lot of people are interested in um, a more leisurely experience and taking the time to actually stop and just have a coffee or have a beer or a glass of wine along the way and people watch. And, and uh, so, you know, we have developed and not just we, other, other uh, travel companies as well have developed um, programs that allow you to go at a bit more of a slower pace. And in our case, we have um, our long stay programs, which we're launching in Europe, um, that go to destinations that aren't necessarily river cruise destinations. Um, but we also have our five by five programs where we spend five nights in any one um, stop uh, on the itinerary. And that enables you to um, see the city or town itself also the environs, but also have time to do things on your own. So 
There are alternatives to consider to river cruising, um, but don't get me wrong, I think river cruising, cruising is, is amazing. Uh, and I think that once you wade through all of the information that's out there, you'll find one that's right for you. If you have questions at all, I'd love to get your feedback. I always like to hear from our members about what they think about river cruising. Uh, and uh, we look forward to being able to include some in our upcoming programs as well. So all the best and uh, when we can get back to it, I wish you happy travels.